it's, uh, when I came to this weekend, it's been about a spiritual formation. Now, you could do a week course on spiritual formation. You could do a year's course on spiritual f foundation. You could do a three-year course on spiritual foundation. So it's incredibly hard to know what to share when you're on a weekend. Uh, but I shared some stuff yesterday about silence and solitude and a few other things. But today, I, I want to share something that's been a real help to me in my journey. And it's the place of... Uh, Doubt and questions in soul care. What's the place of doubt and questions in soul care? And uh, I think it's uh, fascinating. And um, to doubt means to have two minds in the original uh, Greek. And uh, it's, it's double, double-minded. And um, Thomas got his nickname, the famous Thomas in the Bible, got his nickname uh, because he wasn't certain he was a doubter, he was a questioner. And I think it's a bit unfair on Thomas, the press that he's had. I think it's unfair for two reasons. First of all, Thomas was a passionate disciple of Jesus. And said in John 11, we reported that, uh, uh, that Jesus, that Lazarus, the one he loved, was sick. In fact, he dies before Jesus gets back there. But he says, let us go back to Judea. And the disciples say, we can't go back there. They tried to kill us last time. They're going to kill us again, but we can't go back. And it's Thomas who simply says, we're, only sh we're there, and the drives, let us go that we may die with him. Let us go back with Jesus that we may. So this is not some nimby-pamby disciple. This is a passionate, sold-out disciple. And I think the second reason it's unfair is that... Um, the implication is that doubt is a bad thing. To doubt is a bad thing. And uh, I think a better word might be, if it helps, is uncertainties and questions. Where do they fit in the whole gambit of soul care? And for many years, the church has been a place of certainty. Everything was black and white. It was binary. There were no shades of gray. And uh, the Bible teaches that the world was created in seven days. End of discussion. The Bible teaches that a woman's place is at home and not as a leader and not as a speaker. End of discussion. Few brave ones begin to ask some questions, but their salvation was questioned because they were... Jane remembers uh, being in Sunday school, and uh, I don't remember this. We used to have a song, next slide please, uh, that said simply, climb up, climb up, sunshine mountain, heavenly breezes blow, climb up, climb up, sunshine maces, mountain, faces all aglow, turn, turn your back from doubting, look up to the sky, climb, climb up, sunshine mountain, you and I. Has anybody sang that in their past? You have, you see, it's a good UK, and you have as well, it's a good UK thing. And... Um, it's basically saying doubting's wrong. Turn your back on doubting. And um, so we've created over the past hundreds of years a church culture where it hasn't been a safe place to ask questions. So people didn't ask the questions. They just kept them inside and maybe brave with a few friends. I came across an American writer called Rachel Held Evans. And uh, she's a great writer. If you can get her books, she's definitely work uh, writing. She was a Sunday Times bestseller. And um, she wrote mostly about doubt and about questions, about the faith. Uh, and at the age of 32, uh, with her husband and children, she went on to hospital to have an infection treated. And something went wrong, and she died. Age of 38. Uh, with two kids, I think, and a husband. What do we make of that? And she said this in one of her books. There are recovery, she's talking about uh, the whole issue of doubt. There are recovery programs for people grieving the loss of a parent, sibling or spouse. You can buy books on how to cope with death of a beloved pet or work through the anguish of miscarriage. We speak openly with one another about the bereavement that can accompany a layoff, a move, a diagnosis or a dream deferred. But no one really teaches you how to grieve the loss of your faith. Next slide, thank you. You're on your own for that. It became increasingly clear that my fellow Christians didn't want to listen to me or grieve with me or walk down this frightening road with me. They wanted to fix me. They wanted to wind me up like an old-fashioned toy and send me uh, to the fold with a painted smile on my face and tiny symbols 
in my hands. That's an honest person, okay? And there would be no doubt whatsoever, there'd be people in this room that probably would resonate with that. But it's an honest place to be. And God loves honesty. He loves honesty. One of the most terrifying illnesses I think you can have, uh, apart from motor neuron disease uh, and a few others, is locked-in syndrome, where there's no movement in your body, but you're fully alert in the brain. It must be horrendous. And for some people of faith, that's how they feel. They have all these questions, they have these doubts, but they don't feel there's a safe place they can go to be able to voice them and to ask them without being judged. And if you have questions about faith, where do you go? Who do you ask? If something is eating away at you, where do you go? I meet with church leaders who, uh, this is not James, I meet with church leaders who share with me uh, they don't know where to go because they don't know if they still believe, uh, but where did they go? Where, where can they go? And so we talk and we talk about it. And, but what happens if you don't have a place for the question such as, why did God heal that person, but not that person? Is it some randomness to it? Why is there so much suffering in the world? Why is there so much suffering in a world? For scientists, a whole a different creation story. It's not such a big one, I don't think, these days, but where do they go? I quite often get asked, who was before God? <laughs> well, if God existed forever, we can't grasp that with our finite brain. Um, Sometimes my prayers feel like they're bouncing off the ceiling. Um, and God doesn't seem to be listening. And if he is listening, it appears he doesn't care because nothing seems to be coming back. And doubt can be a very lonely place. And church for some in the United Kingdom has become an unsafe space. The younger generation do not trust authority any longer. And I'm not surprised in the United Kingdom for the way that there's many honorable politicians. But nevertheless, truth has become, well, it's gone. And so therefore, they don't trust people in power. And there's scandals in church and abuse and finances. And one of my passions has been with the church I'm involved with is to make it a safe place. We say you can ask any question you want. Any question, we have evenings, we have tea and coffee, and people can come and just ask whatever question they want. The only criteria we give is you ask it with grace. Any question you want, because I want it to be a safe space. I want it to be a space where people can come and to find a space where they think, I don't have to keep my secrets and doubts anymore locked in. I can talk about them. And it's liberating. Jesus asked 300 questions, and he only answered four of them. Questions are very, very powerful. And Jane was my wife, and as you know, I, I love telling stories of a way of learning. She said it's a good way, but the best way is you ask the student a question, and you get them to try and work out the answer. If you can do that, they will learn and remember it much better than telling stories. Telling stories is good, she said. But asking questions is better, better. So questions are an incredibly integral part to soul care. Because if you sit in silence and solitude, and you do it regularly, the questions will come. The questions will come. So where do you go to get the answers to these questions? Uh, as uh, you know, if you came away, I love uh, creative arts. And uh, next slide, please. There's somebody called uh, there she is. There's somebody called uh, Barbara Kruger, who's a conceptual artist, lives in America, New York, and she does these big black and white red. So you may have seen these. Your body is a battleground. I think that's great. Your body is a battleground. Um, uh, the future belongs to those who can see it. That's very good, actually. Next slide. 
I shop, therefore I am. That's a play on I think, therefore I am. And uh, she's clever, but the one that I really connected with was uh, in, uh, as I said, was in New York, and uh, it's uh, in the uh, Hersham Museum, and it's this, next one. This is a huge room. I mean, it is huge, massive. And when I saw that, I, I welled up. Belief plus doubt equals sanity. If you don't have questions and doubt, you're going to have cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is when something up here is different than to your behavior living. And the things you're saying are different to what's up here. It becomes this disconnect. And it, it can be very, very destructive. And doubt is not the opposite of faith. It's not the opposite of faith. Doubt is an element of faith. So what do you do with your questions? What do you do with your questions? First of all, spiritual discipline is you sit with them for a bit. You sit with the question, you explore it in the safety of God, in the safety of the Holy Spirit, you begin to explore the question and reflect on it and react on it. Um, but I found something that has really, really helped me. Uh, and it's these four things. Next slide, please. So, uh, certainty, complexity, perplexity, mystery. Again, great words. Certainty. Certainty is where everything is black and white. When you first become a Christian, whoa, it's all black and white. And uh, yeah, God created the world in seven days. That's what the Bible says. There's no other way. There's no other way to interpret it. No, 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 no. Seven days. It's black and white. Um, and that's okay. You know, it's okay. And then there's complexity. Complexity. I'll keep using the same analogy because it helps. The complexity is you start going, I can only speak to the United Kingdom, you start going to school. And you've been brought up on some day, some day, some day, some day, some day. And suddenly you get to school and you hear about this thing called evolution. You've never heard about it before. And you think, where's that come from? And you suddenly realize life is a bit more complex than you first thought. And it's not quite as simple as we first thought. And then the most dangerous place to be is perplexity. Now, perplexity is this. Um, many years ago in our church was a, a writer, an actor called Rob Lacey. Uh, fantastic man, lovely man. And uh, he, he developed cancer. And so therefore, for the next five years, we prayed for this man. He, he, uh, uh, he flew off to Toronto, it was around the time of Toronto, and he went to Toronto and got prayed in Toronto, and, and then he came back, and uh, he was getting worse and worse and worse, and uh, this is a ho fantastic hospice in Cardiff, and the, the ambulance was booked to bring him to go, and when you go to hospice, that, you know, it's weeks, if that. And the hospice, uh, the, 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 it's, the ambulance is, is booked, and all of a sudden, he's healed. Completely healed. Wow! Fanta thank you, God. We had a celebration on a Sunday morning. We was remarried then to, to, to Sandra Lacey, a dancer. And on, I can see now, they sat on the stools, and I'm there, and I interview them. We had balloons. Some of them did break free and go up the roof like that. And first time we had Prosecco in church in a service. I know in France and Switzerland, you think, oh, that's all hat. But this was the first time we'd had it. Popping of corks, I remember it. Fantastic. Six months later, the cancer comes back. It does exactly the same, except this time he goes to Mexico. All the people you would know who are known as healers and prayers and all that, they came and prayed with Rob. Same journey, five years, nothing's changed. He's close and the ambulance is booked from the hospice and the ambulance comes, he gets in the ambulance, he goes and he dies. What's that about? It is nothing but cruel. 
To get cancer once and to be in remission or to be healed, whichever you want, is utterly fantastic. But to get it a second time so close is cruel. There's no other word for me. Disagree with me afterwards. It's cruel. Where do you go with that complexity? Where do you go with that perplexity? Where did Jane and I go when we discovered we couldn't have children? It's perplexing. It really is perplexing. The danger with perplexity is you stay in perplexity. And the problem with that is you become hard, understandably, in the heart. You become hard in the heart. And when you become hard in the heart, things begin to shut down. Where you've got to go is mystery. And I live in mystery. And mystery is this. I don't understand why in the Old Testament it appears that God not only condones but orders genocide. <laughs> Where do you go with that? Where do you go with some of the stories in the Old Testament? You think, surely God wouldn't do that or say that? And I haven't got an answer, by the way. I've got a few answers that, you know, I'm happy to discuss at some point, but where I go is this. I utterly trust Jesus with all my life. I trust him. And it's a mystery. I, I haven't got the answers to those questions. But I fundamentally trust Jesus. And one day, one day, he will say, this is why. This is what was meant. But until then, I trust him. And I'd encourage you that that is the place to be. It helps you with cognitive dissonance. It helps you with the hundreds of questions that we have. You've got a church that is very open, safe place, and you can ask your questions with openness. And at Matthew 28, 17, I only noticed this six months ago, that's how attentive I am when I study the Bible. It's when Jesus is giving the commission to disciples, you know, going to all the world to make disciples. And, but the verse before says, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, you can read that two ways. You can read it, first one, some doubted, and then Jesus says, I've given you all authority to go into the world. Yeah, don't doubt. That is a legitimate and valid translation. But I also think it could be interpreted, hey, listen, there's rooms in my kingdom for doubters. There is a room in my kingdom for doubters. And I tell you what, there will be a massive room because there will be lots of people there. So don't be afraid of your questions. Use it as part of your spiritual journey as you go forward. I just want to touch on another aspect of spiritual formation, and you have to forgive me. Um, I would do more scriptural exegesis about creativity and the central part it is in the Bible. Uh, so the burning bush, for example, uh, it, that Moses sees, I think it's a part of installation art. If, if that was put into a modern museum, this bush that constantly burned, people go, wow, what a great, oh, that's great art. I think Jesus was the genius, the greatest communicator ever. So he says, listen, when I'm died, I want you to remember me. I'll tell you what we're going to do. Give me some bread, break the bread. It's my body broken. I'll tell you what, give me some wine, pour the wine. This is my blood shed for you. What a fantastic visual illustration. Every time you see bread and every time you see wine, hey, Jesus. It's the power of creativity. So I just want to give you a couple of examples of where it's really helped me. May help you may not help you, but I hope it will. First slide, please. Here we go. Next one, sorry, my fault. Sorry, apologies. OK. So sometimes after a Sunday morning service, Jane and I uh, go to Cardiff Museum. They've got a great Impressionist collection. And uh, I find it very peaceful. I find it a place where looking at beautiful art renews my soul. And it should. It's creative. You know, fifth word of Genesis, created. God's a creative God. And I'm 
probably my favorite artist is Van Gogh, or Van Gogh, if you live in the southeast of England, or if you live in the northeast in Georgia, and it's Van Goghy man, um, but Van Gogh. And the first time I saw this in the museum, it's in Cardiff, I cried, because it spoke to me. And why it spoke to me is another thing. Uh, Van Gogh suffered from emotional and mental well-being issues really, really, really badly. Secondly, he became a missionary to London before he became an artist. And he worked with the poorest of the poor in London. And the church that he was working for came to him. He got to stop doing this work with the poor because he's showing us up. He walked away from church. And who can blame him? Who can blame him? But anyway, this is a month before he dies, before he kills himself. And he would have been in a mental institution at that point. And it's there. You can't quite see it, but there are stripes coming down, which are rain. Okay? There's a bit of debate amongst artists, but, but most think that yellow represents the divinity uh, for Van Gogh. Blue, more, more troubled times. Even in the depth of despair, he's able to paint a picture that still has hope in it. Oh, that spoke to me. And as I looked at it, I personally didn't think it was rain. I'm sure Van Gogh will have words with me, but I didn't think it was rain. I thought it was this. I can't take it any more. Month later, he kills himself. Connected with me. God spoke to me through it. It is a powerful way that God can speak to us. I've been reading um, Bono's autobiography, Surrender. It's a great read. And what he does, he uses 40 songs, titles, as individual chapters. And he just tells the story. It's a fascinating. The first few chapters are about his faith. It is fascinating. But he's got one called 40. And it was written 40 years after his mother Iris died when he was 14. And he said, my father and my brother went to the funeral. And as we walked out of the church, from that point on, my father never, ever, ever spoke about it. We never spoke about my mother. Oh, wow. And 40 years later, 40 years later, he writes a song. This star, that is his mother, that gives us light, has been gone for a while, 40 years. But it's not an illusion. The ache in my heart is so much part of who I am. He's not been able to process it. But in the writing of a song, he is processing it. And I said yesterday, one of the, the, the great things about creative arts is this, is that if you, I, I use it uh, to pray. I, somebody said, why, why, why don't you paint as a prayer? I said, sorry? I said, paint as a prayer. So I, I did. I, I, I started my time. I, sometimes I paint. Sometimes I use, I use uh, what do you call it, uh, pastels. And sometimes I use pencil. And I, I, I just start and I paint like that, like that. The issue is not what comes out at the end. The issue is the process. The issue is, as I'm doing it, I'm trying to sense the spirit of God. And it's also an expression of me to God of what's inside of me. And it's, it's liberating. It's liberating. Uh, we did a prayer labyrinth. Uh, if you don't know what a prayer labyrinth is, it's not spooky, don't pa panic. It's just circles on the floor, and you walk around it, and you have some instructions about connecting with God. And God spoke to me as I was doing it, quite clearly. And at the end, there was some items on a table. You could take one. And I took a, a log about that log. Because God spoke to me. Part of the reason I'm here... It's because of what he said. It wasn't about you personally. It was about something else, but it helped me make this decision. And it's on my desk in my work to remind myself. It's powerful what God can do through creative art. And then finally, if I can have the next slide, s'il vous plaît, if I can. Uh, here it goes. Oh, sorry, my fault. Uh, next one. It's the one of the sculpture, so I think it might be the one after. Here we are. Who recognizes that? It's on Lake Geneva. I know it's not Lake Geneva. I can't pronounce the word. I'm really sorry. It's on the big lake out here. 
I can't even pronounce his name, Albert Gigorgi, is it? Or? Good, thank you. Um, and he, he, his wife died. And he wanted to express the emptiness and the sorrow he felt by her death. So hence the big hole in his head down. And, wow. I used this. When we came out of COVID, we had sort of a, like a, a, where people could come and grieve. Grieve of loss, some lost loved ones. Grieve of loss, some lost jobs. Just grieve of loss of what's gone on. And I put this up and some people just gasped because it captured the essence of where they were at. And it really, really helped them. The, the senses that we have, the power, we breathe in through our nose, if it's not bunged up like mine, we breathe in. Do you know we can detect a trillion songs, a trillion smells, with 400 receptor types? There are 10,000 taste buds in our tongue. And it sends an electrical signal from our tongue to the brain. And it encodes a memory that will remember what the taste is. So if you're blindfolded and you give me that, you go, basil. Basil, because it's in my memory. When my mother was alive and we used to go up to the Northeast, this would always, this would always happen. We pull up and there was a little, little candle in the bedroom, the spare bedroom where we were going to stay. And then my mother opened the door and she goes, Away, man, pet. Oh, it's so good to see you. My father, would be, hello, son, nice to see you. And uh, uh, my mother steps back, she goes, Hey, pet, I think you put weight on. Never mind, I've made your favorite chocolate cake. Come and have a slice of chocolate cake. That's mother's for you. And, uh, and she used to make some Italian dish called chicken cacciatore. Lovely. I can go into any restaurant, into any cake shop, into anybody's house for a meal, and if there's chocolate cake or if there's chicken cacciatore, immediately I think of my mother. It's comfort. My, my memories of my mother are good. My father's slightly different. My mother is good. <laughs> oh. And what I do now, I say, thank you, God, for my dear mother. Thank you, God, for my dear mother. 10,000 reasons, or 100,000 reasons, or a million reasons, I can't remember what it was, uh, to thank God. I thank you, God, for my mother. That's how I, that's how I use it in my uh, prayer life, in my spiritual walk. There's so much that God can speak to us through. Can speak to us through. And finally, if I may, David and Saul. Saul is suffering from, they say he's possessed by the devil, uh, by evil, sorry. And it says that God sent the, the evil spirit to him. I, I, there's theological questions there that are fascinating. Uh, but anyway, they discover that, that David plays the harp and they invite him to come. And every time that uh, Saul gets uh, one of these states, he plays the harp, and Saul is at peace. He's at peace. And it says the spirit left him, the evil spirit left him. That may be true. But I also like to think he had mental health issues. And creative arts are a powerful, powerful tool in mental health. Uh, treatment and it's in the Bible David did it long before anybody knew about mental well-being so I'd encourage you ask your questions let your questions out trust your living, loving father recognize God if you're creative all of us are creative but if you're a creative artist use your creativity to express your love to God, to ask your questions through it. Go to museums and look at art and ask God to speak you through it. Go down to the, the uh, down in Geneva and look at that statue and sit and reflect on it. 
These are creative ways that God can speak to us. Mm. So, um, Sue's going to come back. I'm very happy. As Sue was leading uh, the worship earlier, and the, the uh, song, Oh, Praise the Name of Jesus, it really touched me. And I'm very happy to pray for anybody who wants prayer after the service. Um, it would be my pleasure to sit with you and to pray with you. It really will be a pleasure. So let me pray. Father, thank you that you are our Father. Thank you that you are our loving Father. Pray for all of us, Father, when the questions come in the dark of the night. I pray, Lord, that we will bring the questions to you and bring the questions to people we trust. And may through the journey, may we fall more in love with Jesus. May we trust him with all our life amidst all the turmoil and the questions and the perplexities and the complexities, let us trust him. And Lord, I thank you for the beauty of creativity. I thank you for the gift you've given us, for these mountains that just explode with the joy of creation. I thank you for art, and I thank you for music, I thank you for sound, and I thank you for words. Pray, Lord, that we will be open to speaking to us through them, I pray. Speak into our brokenness, I pray. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen.